From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Glad to have you aboard. During our first half hour today, a visit with K-State's Jason Bergtold and Jeff Williams. They'll discuss their just-released study of the use and effects of continuous no-till crop production in Kansas. This via a number of workshops they conducted with Kansas Farm Management Association members, gathering a wide range of observations on the perceived benefits of no-till cropping, yield advantages, improvement in soil health, time savings, and improved economic returns among those. An interesting project this was. They'll tell us about it next. Further ahead, this week's K-State Horticulture segment, Ward Upham, along to offer advice on fertilizing warm season lawn grass. Plus more right here on Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. Thanks for tuning in. You're listening to Agriculture Today on the K-State Radio Network. On this part of the broadcast, we're going to take up new work out of the Agricultural Economics Department at K-State, looking at a cropping practice which has gained considerable momentum in Kansas over, well, actually several decades, and it's commonplace now. No-till crop production, and particularly how many producers are devoted to continuous no-tillage. And we'll look at why that was such an interesting question now with two of the authors of this study. It's actually a multifaceted project. Joining us from the Agricultural Economics Department at K-State, Jeff Williams and Jason Bergtold. Jason, first of all, to set the table further, what was the inspiration behind this project, which wanted to examine in in quite a bit of depth the adoption of no-till continuously? So we were particularly interested in looking at kind of what is that process that producers go through in adopting different conservation practices. And probably more importantly, one of the big objectives of this project was to look at, so how do we move people from one stage kind of initial adoption to intensify, get them to start building a more structured, more intense conservation system on their farm to go from no-till to continuous no-fill, look at cover crops, precision ag, and different types of conservation practices on their farm. And so we were really trying to study what, what are motivating factors from federal programs, financial incentives, all the way down to what are barriers. So agronomic, climate, ecological, as well as policy and economic barriers that either slow adoption or prevent adoption in different areas. And so kind of what does it take? And so as part of this, we collected a whole amount of information. Um, We held 19 workshops um, across Kansas, um, I think in all regions of Kansas, looking at um, adoption of conservation practices by farmers who had already started to do conservation and then asking them what would it take to intensify. And so we looked at four primary practices, continuous no-till, cover crops, conservation crop rotations, and variable rate application of inputs. And so we're particularly interested in their willingness to adopt those practices, not only as a single practice, but in bundles of practices um, under different conditions, as well as we were particularly interested in how they viewed those practices of adopters and non-adopters and seeing are, are there differences between those and then what do people see as the benefits and costs. And so we're particularly interested in the perceptions of producers about these practices to see if the information we're putting out, one, matches the perceptions or if more work needs to be done on the, I guess, the message side of it, the communication about these to make sure the right information is getting out. Um, And we're answering the questions that people have um, about getting into uh, more intense conservation on farm. So this was obviously an extensive effort. And when you say workshops, you actually brought these producers into, well, talk shops, so to speak, in this case about continuous no-till. Right. Correct. So we brought them in. Um, they gave us histories of their detailed histories of their farms. 
Um, we collected um, information through kind of surveys. We also did really intensive uh, focus groups where we talked with them in depth for a period of time. And then we also did some kind of hypothetical what ifs and asking a bunch of questions and kind of saying what would it take to kind of gauge what would it take to get people to potentially move or increase conservation on farm. And part of this was also training for some people. So we went through some training about these conservation practices. What are they? What does it entail? What are the costs? And, and just for things. definition purposes, so folks are sure, when we are referring to continuous no-till, it's as the name implies. This is a system where producers are fully committed year upon year to no-till practices. Yeah, so continuous no-till is um, no-tillage practices in the field except for the purpose of making a slit for planting purposes mm-hmm. to plant seeds, and that's the only type of soil disturbance that would be allowed. Otherwise, it should be continuous no-till crop after crop, year after year. That's an outline of what the project was all about, but the numbers cruncher was Jeff, you say. (laughs) And so many questions were asked here, Jeff. We'll start with this. The percentage of producers who are, in fact, employing and committed to continuous no-till. Well, first of all, we actually had data from 242 farm managers from these uh, seminars we did. And we found of the 242, 63% of them indicated that they were doing continuous no-till. At least they had some rotations where they were doing no-till on all the crops in the rotation. That didn't mean the whole farm had to be in no-till. Uh, but 63% of those we surveyed were doing it. And that left, of course, 37% not doing it. But even among the 37%, we know that some of them are doing no-till, but just not necessarily continuous. And there were also some a small percentage not doing any no-till. The average cropland voted in terms of percentage to continuous no-till across the data set was 84%. Hmm. Uh, and we had 99 Out of 152 or of the 63 percent, 99 that had 100 percent of their farm in no-till. So the commitment is clear. So there's quite a few. It wasn't it wasn't half, but it was quite a few. The other interesting thing I'll mention here is that only about uh, 23 percent of these continuous no-till users received any kind of government incentive to do it. So that's uh, kind of significant as well. When you talk about that, such things as the conservation stewardship program, uh, EQIP, EQIP, whatever it might be. They, some people did make use of those and received funding, but it wasn't a, a, a major factor from what we could tell in the adoption process. Of those who were doing continuous no-till, 77% of the users were using it on corn, about 79% on soybeans, about 89% with wheat, and about 60% with sorghum. Two-thirds or more of soybean and sorghum producers, they reported they saw yield increases. Uh, This was about 59% for corn and 46% for wheat. So uh, quite a few were reporting a yield increase. A very small percentage were reporting yield decreases. Okay, so... 12%, 12%, 13% or less of these in general were reporting yield decreases for any of those four crops. Uh, there was a group that was reporting no yield effect, uh, but generally most of them were finding yield increases. We also asked them about their observations of what they've seen since they've been doing continuous no-till, and uh, 66% of the users reported lower weed pressures, I'm just I'm going to hit the highlights here. Mm-hmm. Sure. Uh, 95% reported lower soil erosion. 56% reported higher soil fertility. 66 reported it took more management to undertake continuous no-till. 68% reported off-site environmental improvements. 66% reported higher crop yields. And 70% reported higher net returns. So that kind of gives you an overview. Production costs, uh, we ask about that. Mm -hmm. About 40% reported lower production costs, about 30% no change, and the remainder uh, higher. So that was uh, not quite as significant in terms of we had more variability in production costs than maybe we would have expected. A lot of that is in keeping with 
general perspectives about no-till when you think about lower production costs because of fewer field passes, for instance. Uh, this is simply fortifying a lot of those principles, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. We went out and, you know, just asked the farmers what they thought, and it confirms quite a bit of what some of the field studies and the economic analysis of the field studies of no-till have done, have shown throughout the state, really, for the last 30 years. And this study did not necessarily delve into the exact economic returns to no-till cropping. Right. We did not ask for detailed information on econo- on their economics, their costs, their prices, their yields, things like that, in terms of any actual numbers. We just asked questions about what their observations were. Jason, as you consider the general findings here, what's your takeaway from what was said within that analysis? Well, I think um, it confirms something we found in our past work, too, myself and Jeff and some of the other our co-authors, co-researchers have looked at is that no-till, one, is becoming, is in essence, the dominant tillage practice. But I think more than that is there's been a almost a change of heart over the last few decades in terms of seeing where we used to see no-till as a risky practice. Mm-hmm. I think um, this study even confirms more so that more producers are seeing that this is a risk-reducing practice, that this is a beneficial practice, a conservation, something we can integrate into our farm, all the way from eastern Kansas to western Kansas. All right. Well, you did gather still more, Jason and Jeff, from this workshop-based exercise, as you described it where once again these 248 farmers, members of the Kansas Farm Management Association, shared their perspectives on the adoption of continuous no-till crop production. And beyond such things as, as yield, as conservation advantages, and so on, there were some other things they expressed in support of no-till cropping, and we'll get into those after the break, gentlemen, if we might. Our guests are among the co-authors of this Sample of Farmers' Use and Effects of Continuous No-Tillage, Jeff Williams and Jason Bergtold, agricultural economists here at K-State. We'll return with them after this break. You're tuned to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. We're back now on Agriculture Today, and once more, the Agricultural Economics Department here at K-State has just released the first in what is expected to be a series of installments from a broad study that was conducted with the contributions of nearly 250 farmers who are members of the Kansas Farm Management Association here at K-State. They were invited in to attend one-day workshops on conservation practices And specifically, as we're reviewing today, their observations on the pluses and minuses, if you will, of adopting continuous no-till crop production. There were four individuals behind conducting this rather unique study, and two of them are with us today, agricultural economists Jeff Williams and Jason Bergtold of K-State. And just to quickly recap for you some of the basic findings that Jeff shared with us just a few moments ago. Of those 248 members who attended the workshops, 63% indicated that they had, in fact, adopted continuous no-till. As far as the benefits from that, 95% reported a decrease in soil erosion. Nearly 66% reported lower weed pressure. The percent reporting an increase in soil fertility was 56%. They also noted that continuous no-till did require more intensive management. 66% cited that. Then again, 68% reported a greater off-site environmental impact, that is, a reduction in soil erosion, nutrient leaching, carbon emissions, and so on. And as far as bottom line, 66% reported higher yields from their continuous no-till efforts, 40% reporting lower production costs, and 70% 
reporting higher net returns. But Jason, as we pick back up on this, this sample of farmers also made known some other impacts of adopting continuous no-till that they thought were worth including in this analysis. Yeah, what, what was really interesting was, I mean, we saw this variation in costs, perceptions of these cost changes of people think costs went up or down. And it was pretty uniform of uh, people who thought it was lower or higher. But I think something really interesting that, that weighs in there is we also found, we asked about what were some of the unexpected benefits. These and, are ancillary benefits in a lot yeah, of Yeah, so right? these are kind of benefits they didn't necessarily go in adopting no-till thinking they were going to get or they didn't plan on. And so one of those is some of those farmers who adopted no-till all of a sudden found out that they could expand the size of their operation. So it would be interesting to go back, and, and it's something we haven't done, but to look at if farmers who had a perception of higher costs are actually dealing with a larger operation than they had in the past, which could likely be the case. And then the, the other thing that's really interesting and probably one of the most common unintended benefits of no-till was the increase in time. While there was an increase in time in management intensity, I think there is less time because of the less passes across. Or, or more free time. Or more free time. So to do other things besides family being in the field. Yeah. Yeah, besides being in the I field. I mean, farmers mentioned being able to take vacations in the middle of the summer, take a week off, and saying, my farm's all right. Mm-hmm. And that, that free time is also being able to expand operations if you choose to do so. But And then we, we had some other ones of, they were kind of... Uh, People said their spouses were happier, <laughs> right. um, much much less cleaning per se because there's not dust blowing. Uh, but a lot of these other kind of side benefits that just you, they didn't realize until they actually adopted the practice. And Wildlife so, habitat was mentioned in the paper. Yeah, before. and so I, I might add one other thing from the focus groups is that I think rather important that many of the people who consider them very successful at doing continuous no-till view it really as a system as opposed to just a crop. They view it as a complete system of using no-till in a rotation, and it's something they kind of had to work into. It's not something that they expected or actually received benefits immediately the first year. It may have taken a number of years to get to the point where things were working well for them and they were comfortable doing it and kind of had a good feel for what they were doing. And that's important to bring out. This sample was of rather seasoned individuals in this practice. So they're they're not novices by any stretch. They've been around the block in essence, right? That, that's right. And some of the people who did report, we ran across cases where people who reported who, who saw yield declines where people who tried the practice were transitioning, saw yield decline, and then disadopted. So those cases come up as well in terms of they didn't necessarily fully, they may not have fully flushed out kind of the kinks in the cropping system to get no-till to work. And so there's a time period, there's a transition that has to occur. Again, this is a large collection of information condensed down into a write-up, by the way, that folks can read right now on the agmanager.info website. But what do both of you hope will be the fruit of this labor? How do you hope this information will be utilized on down the line? Jason? I think one big takeaway message is that um, what we're finding in our research on conservation, both economic or agronomic, is that some of that information like with no-till is confirming so that information is being so so there's a confirmation that the information being generated by experiment stations and on-farm trials and people who are adopting the practice we're seeing those gains kind of it's matching up i think this also a, a lot of the information and a lot of the data we gathered i think also helps us identify are people seeing the benefits that we're saying accrue from either adopting no-till or other conservation practices. And so are farmers seeing those benefits? And if they're not, why not? And so that's some of what we got into in trying to find those. So we're really interested on kind of the farmers. We're interested in that management perspective, that how are people viewing the practices, and then seeing if that kind of lines up with what Natural Resource Conservation Service or other non-government organizations or extension are saying about conservation practices so that the right message is getting across and that we're dealing with the issues that arise in adopting these practices. And sometimes those issues we haven't anticipated yet. Jeff? Well, as Jason mentioned, we're looking at some other aspects to cover cropping, 
crop rotations, variable rate application. And I think uh, this work will help us see what the farmers are experiencing uh, that are trying it. Uh, are they having as much success with cover crops as they'd like, uh, with variable rate application as they like? And so we're still working on that part of the study. That work's actually going on right now, but uh, hopefully we'll find out more information that people have been do doing no-till a long time. Some of these other things maybe not quite as long, so we'll, we'll see uh, – maybe what some of the issues are there. And as you go through those numbers and to put the pieces together on those angles, there will be reports coming out from agricultural economics toward that end, presumably, right? Yep. Yep. For here now, you can see the opening part of what will likely be quite a series of work from Jason and Jeff. This is entitled, A Sample of Kansas Farm Management Association Members' Use and Effects of Continuous No-Tillage. And once more, numerous producers were involved in these workshops and this data-gathering process to find out what they think about no-till practices and, uh, in particular, where continuous no-till can be uh, successfully adopted. This is posted on the agmanager.info website. In addition to Jeff and Jason, the authors include Elizabeth Canellis of of Mississippi State University, and Noah Shrimsher of Kansas State University, a student here at K-State. So congratulations so far on your work, gentlemen, for it took quite an effort to pull all of this together. We appreciate the update, and thank and, you for coming over. And we appreciate all those people who came to the seminars and spent, and spent all day there. It was quite an undertaking. Thanks again. Joining us, agricultural economists, at Kansas State University, Jason Bergtold and Jeff Williams. Have a look at this interesting information. It's now for your review at agmanager.info. And while we're in this area of cropping systems, we do want to pass along one final reminder for you that K-State researchers have been evaluating cover crop management options for water-limited environments, and those will be on full display at that cover crop field day to be hosted by K-State's Agricultural Research Center at Hayes. That is set for tomorrow. And stressing once again, this is at K-State's HB Ranch research site near Hayes. On that program, K-State's John Holman on his cover crop research and Augustine Obur of K-State will conduct the cover crop plot tour there. Also to take up cover crops and beneficial insects, J.P. Michaud of K-State, then out of Colorado State University, agronomist Megan Shapansky will pass along her on-farm cover crop research information. From the Natural Resources Conservation Service, Dale Younker will take a look at cover crops and soil health, and lastly, grazing cover crops to be covered by K-State's Sandy Johnson. The field day and tour will begin at 9.30 tomorrow morning, again at the HB Ranch. To get there, go four miles south of the Cedar Bluff Dam on Kansas Highway 147. There is a complimentary lunch included, but they're asking you to RSVP so that they can get a meal count. Squeeze that in right away today if you can. 785-625-3425. Again, 785-625-3425. K-State's Cover Crop Field Day tomorrow near Hayes. Those of you with an interest in those cropping options for your rotations, be sure to take that fine program in. This is Agriculture Today. Now we'll step aside for a few moments, returning with today's agricultural news headlines for you. Greg Akagi with this week's Kansas Soybean Update. And more still ahead here on the K-State Radio Network. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. You're tuned in to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Welcome back. Eric Atkinson here. Time now for today's agricultural news headlines for you, courtesy in part of DTN. K 
Kansas Governor Jeff Collier has announced that Kansas will renew its alliance with Japan by rejoining the Midwest-U.S.-Japan Association. Collier met with the Japanese consulate in April in Topeka to discuss the relationship between Kansas and Japan and feels this partnership will be a good way to strengthen businesses and agricultural relations. Japan traditionally ranks as one of the state's top trading partners based on 2017 data. Japan is Kansas' third largest export market overall, totaling $980 million worth. In early June, the Kansas Department of Agriculture will be participating in a USDA-led trade mission to Japan. Japan has been Kansas Agriculture's number two trading partner since 2014. The goal of that trip to strengthen the state's relationship with Japan through this trade mission mission to Tokyo and Osaka. Now, that trip will provide an opportunity to connect with potential customers and take part in briefings and site visits to learn firsthand about maximizing trade relationships with Japanese businesses. Also on trade, the chief agricultural negotiator with the U.S. Trade Representative's Office, who happens to be a native Kansan and a graduate of K-State, says that getting a good deal, no matter what time it takes, is the focus for the North American Free Trade Agreement negotiations. Here's more from the USDA's Rod Bain. There was much talk last week about U.S., Canadian, and Mexican negotiators getting an updated North American Free Trade Agreement done by now. NAFTA 2.0 is still being crafted by negotiation teams. With the update is the chief ag negotiator for the U.S. Trade Representative's Office, Greg Dowd. We have closed nine chapters and six sectoral annexes. We're still working on NAFTA. There's obviously still a lot to be done. And Ambassador Dowd earlier this week said despite the talk of deadlines as of late. Our position on the NAFTA negotiations is obviously you'd rather have it done right than be in a big hurry. He adds for context the complexity of updating NAFTA versus its original development almost three decades ago. NAFTA, the original time, was not a trilateral negotiation. We'd already really kind of negotiated with Canada in 88. So it was really just bringing Mexico on board. Let me tell you the complexity of doing this three ways is exponential. The other point is that when we did NAFTA, the Internet really hadn't existed yet. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. According to the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City, bankers in parts of the Midwest are denying more farm loans as the year-long, years-long slump, that is, in the agricultural economy stretches into its fifth year. The Fed said that lenders in its district, which includes Kansas, Nebraska, and other states, denied more than 8% of farm loan requests in the first quarter of this year due to insufficient cash flow. That's an increase from previous years. The biggest share of denials came in the state of Oklahoma, where producers rely heavily on income from wheat, which has seen prices has dropped, of course, sharply in recent years. The Fed said farm incomes and financial conditions deteriorated for a fifth consecutive year, though higher crop prices and lower land rental rates in the district could help boost farmers' profit margins. And the International Grains Council this morning trimmed its forecast for global grain production in 2017-18 to 2 billion 91 million metric tons due to lower expected soybean production. The new forecast a decrease of 2 million tons from the previous forecast and a 2% drop from the previous season's record of 2 billion 139 million tons, says the IGC. It raised its 1819 production forecast, upping last month's estimate by 1 million tons, now to 2 billion 89 million tons. That figure would mark a second season of declining production after 2016-17's record high. The IGC data revealed that an increase in corn and rice forecasts outweighed reduced soybean and wheat predictions. Driving the fall in the 1718 global grain forecast, a 3 million ton drop expected soybean production, now seen at 336 million tons. Corn forecasts shedding 2 million tons down to 1 billion 44 million. The report estimated wheat production remaining at 758 million tons. Next up for you in agriculture today, this week's edition of the Kansas Soybean Update. And with that, as always, Greg Akagi. Greg? 
Sharla Schween, Resource Conservationist with the Natural Resources Conservation Service, joins us. And Sharla, NRCS's Regional Conservation Partnership Program recently awarded nearly $2.9 million to the Kansas Water Office to help improve water quality conditions within the Milford Lake watershed. Why was this project needed? This project is a very collaborative effort and was needed because of multiple different things. But number one was improving water quality across the Milford Lake watershed itself. They were having several different things occur. One that many people are aware of are the harmful algal blooms that have occurred throughout the lake. Runoff is an issue as well, which is also a concern about what eventually could happen to the lake. There is nutrient and sediment loss that is occurring that is providing some harmful additives basically to the lake that this project working together with everybody can help provide some best management practices to help provide a very positive impact to this region. A project would not work if not for the help of so many partners and the Kansas Soybean Commission is one of many partners associated with this partnership. There's actually 30 partners together. The Kansas Water Office has taken the lead and done an outstanding job collaborating all these different partners and groups. There are partners such as some local officials, some people that are right there on the lake, state, federal agencies, some of the utilities. And that is what is so great about the actual RCPP program. What it does is a comprehensive and flexible program that incorporates this diverse group of partners that can actually stretch and multiply the conservation investment to get this conservation goal on a watershed scale. There is numerous benefits that can occur. The water quality impact, not only in the watershed, upstream, downstream, but on the lake, reducing soil erosion and sedimentation off of the fields that contribute, as well as improving fish and wildlife habitat and soil health. One of the other things is just ensuring future agricultural production and sustainable sustainability across the watershed. The uh, RCPP program actually uses a set of funding streams. In this project, they're actually going to use the EQIP financial funding stream. So that will provide several different financial assistance for different conservation activities and some of the best management practices that can actually help reduce some of the nutrient and sedimentation that is occurring through the watershed. That is Charlotte Schween, resource conservationist with the Natural Resources Conservation Service, who joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Greg Akagi there. Many thanks, Greg. Next up after the break, this week's K-State Horticulture segment, we'll have a glance at an important stage of warm season lawn management shortly here on Agriculture Today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. This Agriculture Today concludes with our weekly horticulture feature. And this, for those of you with warm season lawns, there is a management practice that you'll be likely enacting soon, and that is fertilizing those warm season grasses. And some guidance on that now from Ward Upham, Research and Extension Horticulturist here at K-State. Now, warm season grasses are handled obviously differently than our cool season counterparts, right? That's right. So we need to identify them first. For our cool season grasses, our tall fescue and Kentucky bluegrass, you do not fertilize them now. This is exactly the wrong time for them to be fertilized unless you use a slow-release fertilizer at the recommended rate. That'll get them through the summer. Warm season grasses, however, really starting in June, that's the time where they most need that fertilization. And why is that just from the physiological standpoint? That's because that's when they grow the best. So our warm season grasses like Bermuda, buffalo, and zoysia all grow best during that hot time of the year. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we want to fertilize because they can take advantage of that fertilizer and use it to build that plant up. 
It can fill in. It can resist weeds. It can do all those things it needs to do in order to make a nice lawn. In the case of buffalo grass, one can get away without fertilizing, you say? You can. You can. Now you can. There are some people that never fertilize buffalo. But it does give a little bit darker color. does give it a little more aggressive. So they'll spread into those areas where it isn't yet. But you can't overdo it. You give it too much and you may encourage a little bit of weed invasion. So that in mind... What fertilizer would best suit warm season grass treatment here? Unless a soil test calls for phosphorus or potassium, normally what you're looking for is a high nitrogen fertilizer. That's the uh, nutrient that's going to be used most by these grasses. And especially if you return those clippings, the phosphorus and potassium will recirculate. What analysis as far as a high nitrogen level then? You have a lot of choices. You know, you could get something like a 2954, a 2733. Just so that first number is much higher than the other two, you'll be fine. At what rate, though, Ward? So what you're looking for is at about a pound of actual nitrogen per thousand square feet. And so if you're using a fertilizer where they don't have directions, you can figure out how much to use. If you don't know how to do that, just buy a lawn fertilizer and follow the directions on a bag. It'll be that rate. It'll be a pound of nit- actual nitrogen per thousand square feet. So it's fairly simple. But when to apply? Just any time now? Now that depends on the type of of turf you have. Let's start with Bermuda grass. Mm -hmm. Bermuda grass is one that you can apply anywhere from two to four fertilizations to make a nice lawn. I mean, it's another one you could go all year and not fertilize at all. But if you wanted to make a nice lawn, somewhere between two and four. If you're using four, we're too late for the first one. That would actually take place in May. You can go June, July, and August, but never with any of these grasses, never later than August 15th. If you go past August 15th, you're setting that grass up for winter damage. It's going to be too succulent when we get into cold temperatures, and you may lose some of that grass. And so if you want to push Bermuda, go June, July, and August, but no later than August 15th. If you want an acceptable Bermuda grass lawn, then just June and July. That will work fine. But in the case of zoysia, and or buffalo grass, different scheme here. You they are, and different reasons for why we go less with those two grasses. Zoysia grass, you're going to go once in June, or once in June, and again in July. On all of these, the rate is exactly the same. You don't vary the rate between uh, different applications. It's always that pound of nitrogen per thousand. And so with zoysia, what you run into if you give it too much is it builds up thatch. With most of our grasses, the clippings don't add to thatch. Zoysia, we're not so sure. It has a lot of lignin, which doesn't break down very quickly, and therefore you don't want to go too high on the fertilization. And so if you do go two pounds, in other words, two applications for zoysia, you better be core aerating as well in order to allow that thatch to break down so it doesn't get away from you. We might come back to that core aeration process in just a moment. In the case, though, of buffalo grass, if one is going to fertilize, it's a one-time prospect? It's a, usually a one-time prospect. You can go twice. It's just that you may encourage weeds in there, and so you may have to be on a little bit better weed control program. And so it will give it a little bit better color, though. You know, if you're familiar with buffalo grass, kind of a silvery green type of color, and so that'll give it a little bit darker color if you fertilize twice. Most people are only going to fertilize once if they fertilize at all. And so it's it's our low-maintenance grass. It's the one that needs the less fertilizer of any of these. And upon applying that fertilizer product, watering it in is essential? That's right. You need to activate it. In other words, it needs to get into the soil so those roots can pick it up. You don't need a whole lot of water. You know, a minimum of a quarter inch will get it into the soil. That's all you're going to need, but it does need to be done. You can wait on rainfall or you can actually water it in, but until it gets into that soil, it's not going to do that turf any good. Now, Ward, you mentioned core aerating as a possible practice here. That would be to open up thicker lawns, thatchy lawns, and so forth, right? It does a number of things, uh, uh, good things. And so when you core aerate, what you're doing is doing that at the time when that grass is growing the best so that it recovers quickly. Because it is an injury to the turf. It's a minor one, but it's an injury to the turf. And so what you're doing is you're pulling out a core of soil and then distributing on top of that turf. 
And as that core melts back in, that soil mixes in with the thatch and allows it to break down. But it also, when you open up that soil like that, you're increasing aeration into the soil. And therefore, you get better root growth. It also increases the water infiltration rate. Those holes fill up with water and then allow that water to soak up more quickly. And so core aeration does a lot of good things for that turf. And so it's a good practice to practice regardless. But still, uh, especially if you have some problems with that turf or you need to open it up uh, due to a thatch problem, those types of things, it's really important. But if one is going to go this route, they probably ought to do it fairly soon before we get into the depths of the real hot weather. That's right. So first half of June would be a really good time to do that. And you can rent core aerators. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of a job to do. Uh, You have to get kind of used to handling the machine, but uh, you can do it. Once more, if you need more information on managing those warm season lawns, the zoysia, buffalo grass, the Bermuda, there's loads of information through your local extension office or go online to the K-State Horticultural website and you'll find what you need to know there. Thanks, Ward, for coming over. You bet. On fertilizing warm season grasses for this week's K-State Horticulture segment, that's Ward Upham. He's a research and extension horticulturist at the university. And that is our time for today. As always, we appreciate you being along with us. Please rejoin us right here tomorrow, won't you? Meantime, Eric Atkinson bidding you a good day. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.